Welcome, my name is Tommy Sheridan, and I'm the Conservation Network Manager here at WCN, or the Wildlife Conservation Network. Uh, so thank you all for joining us for this Closer Look, which is our unique opportunity to get you guys to connect with conservationists from around the world that WCN supports, who are working to ensure that wildlife and people coexist and thrive every day. Uh, so this year at WCM, we're actually celebrating our 20th anniversary, which is exciting. Uh, and thanks to the trust and generosity of many of our supporters, uh, we've had an increasing impact on wildlife conservation. So coinciding with our 20th anniversary this year, uh, we actually brought on our 20th partner to WCM's partner network, which is the McCall Recovery Network. So today you'll be hearing from uh, some staff from the McCall Recovery Network, or, or one of our newest partners at WCM. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about the Macaw Recovery Network's work. Uh, with less than only a thousand individuals worldwide, the critically endangered great green macaw is one of only two native macaw species in Costa Rica. And the Macaw Recovery Network, or MRN for short, was founded by Dr. Sam Williams, who works with partners across the species range to restore their populations, while also protecting and reconnecting habitat. So MRN recently brought also uh, the endangered yellow-naped Amazon parrot under their conservation efforts, and they hope to see thriving populations of both these species flying over protected forests throughout their ranges. So a little bit about our, our guest today, Dr. Sam Williams. Uh, he's had a lifelong fascination with parrots. He completed his undergraduate degree in ecology at the University of Stirling in Scotland, and he completed his doctoral studies on the island of Bonaire to help the conservation of the island's yellow-shouldered Amazon parrots before he moved his focus to Costa Rica, uh, where he began working in 2015. And Sam brings incredible energy, scientific expertise, a lot of good humor, and a passion for conservation for his fight to help save macaws and, and parrots widely across their range. Uh, so I've had the pleasure, luckily, of, of visiting MRN's tremendous team in Costa Rica and I'm confident that today's presentation from Sam will help transfer some of you out to the rainforest there. Uh, so I hope that you enjoy it. And on that note, I'll pass it over to Sam for a brief presentation before we have the chance to chat together during a Q&A about MRN's work. So thank you all for joining and over to you, Sam. Great, thank you very much. Uh, it's lovely to be here chatting with you all. And um, I'm gonna share my screen and we'll get into this. And if you can hear the dog in the background, he's dreaming. Uh, he's being, I don't know, I hope uh, that microphone doesn't pick it up. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about uh, our work here in Costa Rica and it's a big team effort. And um, uh, it's, yeah, this is, it's a privilege to be able to talk about what the team get done and all, all the work that they do. Um, as Tommy's mentioned, we're working with I'm working with uh, two macaws and, a, and an Amazon parrot, but today I'm going to focus on this species, the great green macaw. And um, this is this is the, the rarest of the three species that we're working with, and it, it's really uh, on the very edge of extinction with, with only a thousand left. And just briefly, we work in three main areas. So, so we actually work with the birds directly, and we do hands-on management of the birds, and the, the idea is to try and increase their numbers as quickly as we can. But there's not really any point doing that unless we're also thinking about where they're going to live. And um, this is an area of forest that we're, we're, uh, where our team are based uh, up in the uh, north of Costa Rica. And there's actually three great green macaw nests in this photograph. Um, a really important piece of forest. And when we save the birds and we increase the numbers of birds, we need to think about where they're going to live and we need, we need forest. And the great greens are a little bit picky, to be honest. They, they really like good forest. Um, scarlet macaws are more adaptable and, and, and can actually sort of do okay in some semi-urban environments even. And then there's no point working on the habitat if we're not thinking about working with people. And so this is um, our group of women rangers and other members of the community at the inauguration of our uh, Casa de Tito, which is the, the nursery that the, the women rangers are, are where they are growing plants uh, for, for the macaws. And this is uh, where this is where the habitat and the, the community work uh, overlaps. And we're very invested with the, this group of ladies and, and uh, it's really a privilege, it's an honor to work with them. So um, that's our community work. But today we're going to focus on the parrots. Um, the macaws are amazing because they're this incredible flagship species. And uh, this is a, you know, a three story high painting of a macaw. Uh, the Land Rover was there to give you a sense of scale. 
Um, and I and I talk about this and say, well, you know, uh, can you think of a, a painting of a of an opossum or or you know some other species that's not quite as charismatic? Well, you don't you don't really find too many paintings like that, but macaws lend themselves to this because they're so colourful and people can see them and and uh, you know experience them in the wild because they they're noisy, so you see them, you hear them, and then you you always see them. Um, and that means that they're accessible to people. And that, that's a really important uh, part of this, this picture with conservation. Um, the great green macaw is, is kind of boring green when it's sat, uh, perched, but when it flies, it's got tremendous colors. And so when we, we protect them, we protect all these other species as well. So we protect them. And to do that, we need to protect the habitat. And when we protect the habitat, I mean, there's there's over 500 species of birds recorded in the forest where the great green macaws are found. So we're protecting all these other boring species that are not as glamorous, but as equally valid to be protected and worthy of being protected. So I hope you like maps. I'm going to go into, I have a couple of maps to, to show you today. The great green macaws found over six different countries from Honduras, the eastern end of Honduras in, in the north of the range, down through Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama, into Colombia and uh, and then just into, into Ecuador as well. There's a, a couple of populations down there. So they're, they're scattered around these different areas. And when we look at uh, this area of Costa Rica, the north of Costa Rica, when we zoom in here, this is the border, and then this is Nicaragua up here. Um, the, the great rumor cause are sort of found roaming around in this, this area. And um, that's where our team are working. It's, it was uh, rainforest. The, the, it's to the east of the mountain chain that runs down the middle of the country. So the, the rain that lands there flows out into the Caribbean. Um, so this is, this is an area where we're going to talk about Boca Tapada is on the map there. And that is uh, where the women rangers are based and, and the, the Casal del Tito is there. These are macaws up in the wild there. This is just video I took from my phone. And this is when I was doing participating in a census and we were counting the parrots. That's really the most important metric we can have for the wild birds is to understand how many we've got left. So we go out and we count them and I'm going to be doing it next week, actually. Uh, it started at the beginning of October. We do this. And um, the, this gives us a number of, uh, of birds in the country. And, and that, that's a really important uh, baseline. What we're also doing is looking at the nesting of the birds. We've been doing this for uh, four years now, where we're actually um, go and actually inspect the nest and count how many eggs are there and how many chicks and how many chicks leave the nest and fledge. This was done at a lower intensity for the past 25 years. And then we've added to that and improved it and sort of got more detailed information. When we monitor the nest, this is Mrs. Parrot as she's about to go into a nest. This is in a mountain almond tree. Um, these are these green dots here are, excuse me, are the nests uh, of great green macaws. Again, you see it's in the north of the country. And um, when they're nesting, we know exactly where they are because they're tied to these physical trees, the, to the to the to the nests themselves. But after the nesting uh, is done, they, they kind of move off. And that's that's kind of a question for us as to, to what happens. Um, but when they're in this in this northern area, we, we know exactly where they are and we can we can see what's going on. And with the monitoring that's happened, we've been able to say that there is productivity, that we're seeing chicks coming out of nests. So what you'll notice here is the cat, the Land Rover making another cameo appearance here. Uh, and this is a giant mountain almond tree. And up here, you've actually got uh, one of the, a young lady from the team who's inspecting uh, one of the nests. Now, if you've seen one of our virtual presentations, uh, I actually did a, we filmed the presentation. I was sat on this branch. It was quite a lot of fun uh, filming that. Um, so the, these are macaw nests. And uh, it's, it's really exciting work to actually go out into the field and, and to be checking these nests. And we've seen that there's, uh, productivity around 20 to 40 chicks every year, probably closer to 40. But if we're conservative, we say we say 20. We know that um, there's this has been happening. There's been productivity for the last 25 years, 29, I think now with our work and the, the previous work. Um, but what we don't see is any increase in the population. Uh, and that so that doesn't really add up. And um, that's something we've got to understand. 
you think, well, you know, you, you, so really we're in the business of making things common. That's, that's conservation. And really there's only two things you need to worry about there. And that's productivity and uh, survival. If you uh, have lots and lots of babies and they all survive, then your population is going to increase so long as your adults are also surviving. Um, so we've been monitoring the nest. We see this productivity. Something that happened this year, which was actually a little bit unusual, was we got a phone call and um, there'd been a nest tree and it collapsed. So this is the this is Mario, our, our man in the field. Um, and this is at the tree which had fallen over. And um, unfortunately, one of the parents was uh, killed in this accident. But the chick actually survived. It probably had a nasty concussion from falling in a nest cavity and, and being rattled about. But it did actually survive. And so we this is the chick, uh, just because people had rescued him and put just uh, sort of, it, it looks like the adults, but he's just a couple of weeks short of, of leaving the nest. Um, so what we did is we took this chick and we, we fostered him into a nearby nest where there was other chicks of the same age. There an, another chick. There was only one. And now there's two. Um, and, and he actually fledged and survived. So that was a nice heartwarming story. But really, that's kind of the exception, not the heartwarming part, but the, the, the crisis part is really the exception. Because normally the parrots are doing, they do perfectly fine and they produce baby, lots of babies. And we've got that productivity. So what we've been doing is trying to understand what's happening to those birds after they leave the nest. So we take a, one of the juvenile birds before it's fledged, and here we're fitting a radio transmitter. And that allows us to monitor the birds. So um, this is uh, one of the chicks. We actually radio, check the, uh, radio tracked the chick uh, that we uh, fostered into the nest, and that bird has just been seen um, last week, actually. Uh, so I'm happy to report that if you're in any doubt as to whether that would work, uh, if he survived the concussion, I can confirm he did. I forget his name, actually. Uh, it's, it escapes me right now. But yeah, he's he's doing all right, which is really great news. Um, but we wanted to we wanted to understand better. So we have 10 of these collars. We put them on ticks from 10 different nests. And, and you can see this is one of the ticks. You can just see the collar here. It's been located with the with the antenna tracking it, and then we've we found the bird, um, and we we found we've only found and, and uh, consistently tracked four of the individuals that have had the collars, and we think that the other the other birds have fled uh, have gone north. So this is Mario in the field again. The Land Rover makes cameo appearance. Uh, extra height is helpful when you're radio tracking. So any extra height you can get, you you, you do that. Uh, and then Mario, this Mario in the field, um, uh, scanning scanning for the birds. Um, he's gone far and wide in Costa Rica and, and the very far northeast corner of Costa Rica. There's no roads, there's rivers. And for me, this is a very sort of, uh, sort of um, a jungle expedition kind of feel when you're on a riverboat. I really quite like it. Um, but unfortunately, there's no no parrots were found on this trip at all, and that's what we're finding a lot. But and you know, in scientific terms, that's important data. The zeros tell us something. It's not a lot of fun when you're not actually you know successfully tracking the birds. But Mario has diligently kept notes and recorded his GPS location and and the birds. If you know where he scanned for all these different birds and and if he's ever picked any birds up on the on the transmitter on the receiver. Um, so this is the nesting area. We picked 10 of the nests from this area, um, nine different nests. There was one nest we picked, and then we fostered the other bird into that nest. So that nest actually had two chicks. Um, and four of them we've kept track of, but six of, the, six of them have, have gone, and we think that they've gone to Nicaragua. And what we're expecting it to happen in the next month <clears throat> is we'll find them again at these large communal roosts where we're doing the census. Because in, in October, um, the birds are back. There's there's a couple of big roosts along this area down here. Um, there's other roosts that we know of. Roosts are where they sleep, and they're, they're very, very social, and they all gather together. And so we'll go to those areas, and what we're hoping is we'll re-encounter those individuals, and that will tell us about the survival. It won't tell us so much about the distribution, where they're going over time, but it will tell us about the survival. 
And this is this is eBird, which is uh, citizen science data that tells us where the birds have been uh, seen. It's very biased to where people go, and particularly where tourists are going. So there's a, there's you know there's lots of sightings along the roads here, and this is a road around here. Um, this is also a popular uh, tourist area. Uh, not so many sightings out here where there's no where there's no roads. Um, so it's. Um, this is useful information all the same. It does tell us something. And um, the radio callers we're hoping are going to kind of help us understand this. But we've also been uh, out in the field with a professor from New Mexico State University. And we're looking to do a collaboration with, with them and have a master's student. And we're actually looking to do GPS tracking devices so that we can get a better understanding of where the birds are going. We know that the, the habitat has been degraded and the um what was continuous rainforest across this caribbean slope uh we lost a lot of that particularly from the sort of 70s and 80s where uh well actually back to the 50s we lost from the 50s we lost lots of uh sort of land almost clear cut uh to make way for the sort of meat production for, for the booming fast food industry in, in north america and then since the 80s it's we've actually lost mountain almond trees which were extremely hard wood they were too hard to cut with chainsaw prior to the 80s. The technology, it was the, the addition of carbon steel blades, uh, saws on the on the chainsaws. So we, we know that the habitat isn't uh, perfect. And we're trying to understand all these different uh, aspects of it. Like, why are the parrots here and not over there? Uh, is it driven by the habitat? Things like that. But we're also trying to understand, first of all, the basic pattern of where the parrots are in different months so we've got that ebird data that map that i showed you we've got our own anecdotal our own recordings and anecdotal observations and we wanted to try and enhance that but we know that the the costa ricans in, in rural areas they're not going to go and um uh get onto ebird and get a whole login and, and and all that kind of stuff but everybody here is on whatsapp so we what we did is we set up a whatsapp uh, hotline and just a simple phone number and we had people uh, reporting sightings and some of them sent us pictures and this is actually one of the photos that was sent to us by somebody uh, you know a member of the public and here's another one a phenomenal picture and somebody had just you know sent us this by whatsapp said yeah we've got some parrots in our garden today or so you know really amazing amazing stories and um, we've had I think now over 150 different uh, sighting uh, records. That was more biased towards when we were doing the census last year. We're doing another push on it now and announcing it publicly. And then we try and get um, get more recent sightings prior to doing the census again. But another layer of detail that we're trying to add on is, is working with a PhD student. We've been tracking, um, we've been putting passive audio recorders in on where these dots are these dots are every 10 kilometers north south east west um now if you think of elephants you'll think of camera traps you would you would put camera traps out and you would you know you'd see the elephants or, or other mammals would would walk past the camera trap the, that doesn't really work for parrots but they're loud so we can take advantage of the audio recording and basically same idea but just with audio this is really high-tech sophisticated science uh, as you can see here, the attachment is very much the epitome of high tech. Uh, this is the device in a Tupperware box, zip uh, uh, duct tape to a tree branch, which I, I think it's wonderful. You know, there's all this uh, science, and then then actually it comes down to a bit of duct tape. Um, so this this is how we put the recorders out, and and Tom is is working on this data now. It's you know, a tremendous amount of data. He's trained a, a, the machine learning so that it can distinguish a scarlet macaw from a great green macaw. And uh, we've got um, already got some really great data and, and really interesting uh, observations. And we're looking to add that. So we've got multiple layers of, of sort of imperfect data, which will help us understand where the parrots are going. This, you might think, is people looking at parrots, but it's actually people looking at trees. This is our volunteer team. They're out in the field looking at the, tre at the trees and understanding what state 20 different species of trees are in so each month they go out and they find out whether the tree is fruiting if it's got seeds if it's uh, you know if it's flowering if it's fruiting if it's got leaves or maybe not even got leaves and we're trying to understand across time and across the landscape how that varies as well so we can overlay that with this where the parrots are going 
and then look at food distribution if see if that's what's driving these patterns. Um, so this is phenology, uh, and it's an important uh, sort of part of our our building our understanding of of the work. And that's it's a really important investment at this point because when we understand this, if we take a couple of years to understand this better, then we can really uh, target our impact, or target our our actions, so that we have impact. We can we can make sure that we're propagating the, the species that are most in need at certain times of year where there's food shortages. We can make sure that we're um, doing the you know focusing in the right areas and so on and so on. So it's it's a really really valuable uh, investment at this point to increase our knowledge, because ultimately this is what we're aiming for. We want as as much really great habitat as we can. Uh, and, and one of the things we're doing is looking to protect forest as well, this primary forest. There's all these different tree species. Um, they're all producing food in different ways at different times. And that diversity is really, really important for, for the parrots across the year. So that brings us back to the map. And, and you can see that the, you know, the birds are going different places. And we need to understand what why that is, where they're going, and, and, and sort of how the um, habitat uh, is is affecting their movement. What we also know from this is that up here uh, in the very northwest of this particular map, there's an area of really, really good forest, but there's no macaws found over there. So that's another aspect of our work. I'm not really going to go into that, but that's where we're doing reintroduction because when we, when we understand the birds' movements uh, better and we look at the habitat, we know that there's unutilized forest up here. And so that's where these guys come in. This is our breeding center where I am at the moment. And these are young birds that we've bred in captivity that we'll do reintroduction with. And so we can put those back into forest that's not been used currently. And, and again, this advancing our knowledge on this stuff is helping us pick out the best places to, to do the reintroduction work. When we do this reintroduction work, um, it's really something, it's incredible to see, and you really must come down and see it. We've already got scarlet macaws flying around in this area that were captive bred and then are now breeding in the wild. And that is really incredible. That's in Punta Islita. And then we're hoping to have a reintroduction site for great greens uh, just in the, in the next year. As Tommy mentioned at the beginning, our ambition here is to see the great green macaws thriving and flying over healthy rainforests. And it would be uh, really a, a wonderful thing to see. And, and I'm really excited uh, to be part of that journey. Uh, and um, and it's wonderful to have you along board, uh, on board with it too. Thank you all for your tremendous support and hope you'll uh, find us at the, the Jane event. Um, uh, hope you find me at the Jane event. I'll be there in person. We can we can chat if you uh, don't ask a question now, but please uh, ask your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sam. Uh, I'm sure there's plenty of applause that we can hear from the audience, but uh, we're seeing tons of questions in the chat uh, for you. So uh, I'll try to prompt some of those to you. Um, I didn't have my timer, so I have no idea if I've run over or anything. So I apologize if I've waffled on. So. <laughs> No, no problem. It was perfect. We have actually like 30 minutes or so if, if uh, so we have plenty of time for questions still. Um, so thank you, Sam. Um, I'll get started actually with one. Uh, we have a few questions about the actual biology of the birds and their nesting behavior. Uh, yeah. so, uh, some folks were curious. We had questions from Diana and, and Frauke from Norway actually too, uh, who asked, do the birds typically return to the same nesting site every year so that it's easier for your team at MRN to locate them? Yes. Yeah. Because I mean, macaws are big parrots. They're over a meter, well, about a meter long. Um, and so they need a massive tree, uh, which forms a cavity because they're lazy. They're not like a garden bird. They don't make a, a regular kind of nest. Um, they, they they need these big cavities and there's, there's not, they, there is at the moment, it seems like there is enough, whether there's enough in the right places, we have to kind of work out. But um, there are there are um, yeah thirty or more nests that are used every year, and um, they use the same the same pair are using the same nest uh, year after year. Um, we don't know enough about the dynamics of that, how often that changes, but uh, yeah, they 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 do, and that that's great for us. Uh, it's also great if you're a poacher. If you if you're a poacher, and that's particularly the that's not so much the problem with the great green macaws. It's more the problem with the yellow-naped Amazon. 
The yellow-necked Amazon is highly desired as a pet bird, and people will go back to the same nest year after year and take the chicks. So those parents are not producing any chicks. Um, and that's, that's a problem. And, and it's particularly a problem if, if the poacher is really short-sighted and cuts down the tree uh, to collect nests, uh, collect the chicks. So it's, it's got um, it's a quirk of their biology that's got pros and, pros and cons for sure. And is there a certain time of year that they typically nest at? Yeah, the great greens will be, they start sort of um, having a look and have sort of funny rituals of sort of going back and just re, re uh, I guess like the sort of the penguins, how they all, you know, reaffirm their bond and all that kind of stuff. Um, they, they'll they go back to the nest, they'll hang out, they'll be generally sort of playing house and then they sort of get, get on with things from January. They're laying eggs in January and then um, it's about a month of incubation and then three months with the chicks in the nest. And then they, they fledge and they're on their way. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, so I'm a little bit more about their biology. It's amazing the technology you guys are doing to capture their, their audio calls and try to identify species and population estimates in the range. Uh, but Tim Mather asked a question, do, does each specific bird as an individual, not just a species, but do they have also unique calls that allow you to potentially identify individuals? Yes. yes. Wow. Just as you and I sound differently, I speak perfect English, obviously, and you're a New Yorker. So, um, but um, what we've found, what Tom, our PhD student, has found is that in specific contexts, we can identify individuals by voice, basically. And um, the context that we we know is when the when Mrs. Parrot is in her nest. Um, the male comes along and he calls to her and he says, morning, love, I've got your breakfast. And she she knows it's him and she'll come out of the nest and be fed by him. Um, and I found this interesting when I was doing my PhD with, with Amazon parrots because there was a couple of places, kind of like canyons, with three or four parrot nests in the same space. And, and they know, they absolutely know who's who. The female is not coming out of the nest when it's the other male. She's only coming out when it's her guy. Um, and so, yeah, they absolutely know. And in that specific context, we can identify, you know, we can distinguish, you know, Bob from James or Jose from Fabio or whatever. So, um, yeah, so they do. Yeah. And, and um, what were the colleague that were the, the researcher that we're looking to collaborate with, he's really interested in looking at in the nest. Does the, there's some birds where it's been shown the parents have got different names for each of the chicks. And, and I mean, parrots are so highly social and they're vastly intelligent wouldn't be a big surprise if they if they already named them in the nest incredible wow yeah it seems like the more our technology improves for studying ecosystems and biology that we're learning more and more that this yeah. predictions or estimates people had about dialects between individual animals is seeming to be more and more true even with marine mammals in the ocean and macaws. Oh, yeah I, I have a little bee in my bonnet about this, so I'll just I'll just add a little thing. Um, thing I don't like about science is we say it doesn't exist until we can prove it. And like, you know, my dog over there, when I come home, he's happy to see me. I know that. I don't need to do a scientific study. And I don't like that we, you know, we have to prove that it's the case. Um, and it's like we know parrots are super smart. We, we know, you know, I absolutely convinced that they don't just fly around the landscape willy-nilly they commute to the tree the specific the tree that they know has fruit in that particular month and when we understand that better that's going to help us do reintroduction because they have none of that cultural knowledge when we understand that in the wild uh in the context of the wild birds it's going to help us protect the forest uh in much more sophisticated and targeted ways amazing Okay, I'll ask one more question from the audience about their population, and then we'll get into some questions about uh, Emiran's work with the community and, and collaborations with other yeah. Costa Rica as well. But uh, Julio asked, uh, have you been able to estimate the overall population of the macaw, pro probably the great green in specific, uh, in Costa Rica with the data you've yeah. captured? You guys are working on more population estimates. It, um, the the Estimate is, is around 350 birds, I think. Um, that's kind of where we're at. There's some there's rate, there's error bars on that. Um, but it's about 350 individuals. Um, Tom, with his clever science and his audio things, thinks he can predict uh predict it better. I I like 
seeing birds. I like going. Yeah, there's one. There's another one. There's three. Um, but Tom, Tom's got his uh, clever science stuff, and he thinks it might be more like five to six hundred. So there's there's definitely some some room uh, for improvement there to, to sort of bring these two numbers closer together. Make sure we're we're getting it right. Um, but what it tells us is it's not 3,000. It's not even 1,000 in Costa Rica. Um, there might be a bit of you know, give and take, but it's it, it's close enough for me that we know we need more birds. That's all we need to know. Um, the, the census work takes place in October, the beginning of October. And this year, we're actually leading a range-wide effort. We've reached out to, I think, 70 different organizations and um try to contact uh, people uh, people or organizations in in uh, the six countries where over the, the same long weekend I think we're um, we're going to be uh, counting the parrots I'm, I'm, I don't know that actually if it's a long weekend or, or I know I'm doing it on a weekend or whether actually we're extending the the window to a week uh, those kind of we're deciding on that one um, and and Jose and Cesar on our team have been leading this effort. And we're, we're going to do a six six country count. Won't be perfect by any stretch of the imagination. There's areas of Honduras which you just can't go to. Um, but it will be a joint effort, which is something we're really, really excited about. And um, and that will be the start this year and, and you know, something to work on and improve as, as time goes on. Brilliant. Good to hear. So, yeah, on that note of collaborating with other organizations, because we can't all do this alone, uh, we had some questions from Sonia and Diana about specific orgs they're aware of in Costa Rica that they were curious if you work with more or are familiar with. Uh, one of them, Diana asked about, do you know or interact at all with OSA Birds, which is an organization I think that works on the OSA area? Yeah. Um, we, we don't. Um, people often ask us about that because there's lots of scarlet macaws down there and um, it's the stronghold for the species. And they say, well, are you working in, the, in OSA? And it's like, no, we don't need to. There's loads of birds. And so um, it would be sort of inappropriate for us to put our efforts on, on where, the, where there's lots of birds when there's rare birds or you know, endangered species over here. So we actually don't have a, a reason to. We, we visited one, one of our team uh, went down to Osa and was uh, visited a partner, and, and, but more around um, native plant nurseries and was looking at how they're doing it down there and things like that. And, uh, but it wasn't, it was Osa conservation, I think. Um, so we, we, you know, we're, we're nice and friendly, but we don't actually have a reason to collaborate and work on anything together at this point. Great. Okay. We like to think we're friendly anyway. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, if the audience, if you guys know of other orgs that you recommend feel free to drop contacts or websites for MRN to keep an eye out for. The other one, Sonia Noring, who's from New York, asked, uh, does MRN at all partner with a group called Natua Macaw Conservation Sanctuary? Yeah, which Rodolfo and Mino. Yeah, yeah, we, we know them well. And um, what we're hoping to do, they, they also have uh, a population, captive population of great green macaws. And um, we're hoping that with our reintroduction work that we can uh, collaborate with those with those guys. They're they're great guys, and we've yeah we've, we we know them well. Awesome, good to hear. Okay, uh, next question we have is from Leandre, who's from the DRC, and Leandre was asking about uh, some of MRN's project work to support uh, communities in Costa Rica. So she was asking, or he, I'm not sure was asking if there's any tourism income that you guys are generating with the local community members um, or how you guys interact at all with local community yeah. members. Yeah. Um, we, um, here in Punta Lita, we have a, a, a visitor center and a, and a tour. And uh, the tour, uh, you, you, you know, get to see the, the scallop across that are here. And, and that's an important source of income for us as well. Uh, but what, what we also do is in our visitor center, we have art, local art, and we've, we've worked with the local artists and, and actually helped um, help train them on different techniques. So they, they've got more diverse portfolio um, helped, you know, advise, advise them on sort of what's selling and what's not selling and, and, and so on. And so there's, there's been a group of, um, I think it's almost exclusively women. It's a small group. It's a small village. Um, but uh, they've been uh, benefiting from the parrots for I think uh, seven years now um, through through this program, and um, we were actually looking at this 
a bit more and looking at how we can scale it and make it go a lot bigger and, and be of more benefit for more more benefit for more people. Um, we're also looking at that with when we look at the the great green call reintroduction, we're already looking at how we can bring benefit for the community. We're um, hoping to hear about some uh, a, a big grant on on rainforest protection and and buying a, a patch of land. Um, and really, we see that as a community asset. We want we want to be able to um, protect the forest and sort of bring it to the community as an asset that they can can draw value from and, and work with them. Talking about um, a sustainable doing a sustainable development plan and 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 collaborating with other private protected areas to as a, as a larger group as a network, creating a bigger thing. Um, not that a tourist will necessarily see more, but just by having multiple places together, it becomes a, this thing. And then, then this thing can attract more people to the area. And then, then we can sell them more, more products and things like that. So, so there's various things. We're, we're um, definitely looking at, at that more and more and, and wondering about different ways. Is tourism the only way or is, um, or, or sort of more tangentially um, food production? Is there ways that we can work with the local community? They've now got the ladies, the women rangers have got skills on propagation and plant production. So it's like, could we transfer that to food production? And then they can actually sell that food to local people and, and to local businesses, you know, tourism businesses, and actually make, make an income from this. Uh, and, and then that being ultimately a benefit for the parrots, because if they're they're doing like permaculture production really intensive production in a small area then that reduces the amount of forest you need to cut down to to make a farm um or it allows us to reforest some areas there's a long rambling answer answer i hope that answered the question yeah it was great thank you so um <laughs> following up on that one so uh if folks did want in the audience to visit uh susan asked is there a best time of year that we could come and visit the recovery center i um february march is always good um there's uh yes yeah, quite a bit to see it's it's the also the high season but there's never a bad time to come to costa rica <laughs> i agree um and if folks want to visit is it still they can do so through the airbnb uh experiences should i link to that for yes me? yeah there's we're on airbnb uh we've, we've got experiences there i think that there's more information on our website if you fancy a treat, you can come to the, the hotel. Here is Hotel Punta Islita, and um, it's a wonderful place to stay. And um, yeah, this is just one one of the destinations. And um, we, yeah, there's I think there's more information on that on the on the website on our. Uh, but yeah, the, if Megan's maybe got the a Airbnb info as well. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question to follow up on. Uh, some of, I think you you went through with your community work and that touches on this, but Paul asked what steps are being done to combat poaching. So maybe you could talk about the education work that Emeran does as well. Yeah, well, actually we're, um, we're, what we're looking to do in the next 12 months is actually work with the authorities and actually do education with the authorities and, um, and, and to support the enforcement of the law and, and help them help them be in order you know to be able to do enforcement because they don't even know really the, the, you know there's on paper it's the parrots are protected but it doesn't really translate so how can we you know we looked at that and said well we can the educate the most important education is actually working with the, the law enforcement on the sort of uh the the whip side of things but on the carrot side of things we're also doing education for the community and, and outreach and sort of improving understanding of, of the situation for the parrots um, and, and sort of making sure that um, they they know that poaching is bad. Um, we, we've done some work in the far northwest and um, the, the yellow, yellow nape damsons in the drier areas in the northwest of the country. And we worked with a partner organization who'd done, done this with turtles. They, they got the local community monitoring the turtle nest and then everybody went, oh, all, when we eat all the eggs, there's no more turtles. And so we're kind of wanting to do that with, with the nest monitoring of parrots as well. And, and that's something we've, we've had a go at. Um, and we're, we're sort of evaluating whether we've got the resources to do that, uh, do that work or not. Um, so, yeah. Okay, great. 
Well, the more resources you have, the more you can do amazing projects like that too. So of course. More of your work. Um hint hint. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, one other question from Leandre was, uh, you alluded to a few other species that might not be as charismatic as macaws, but are still in the forest um, that are benefiting from their protection as well. So could you share what are some of those other species that are around the forest you protect? Well, all of them. I mean, when we, when we, because the great green macaws are picky and they like good forest, then it, it really benefits everything. I mean, we've got, um, we've got jaguars, which themselves are charismatic as are tapirs, but then, um, there's, I mean, there's 500 different species of birds. There's a, there's a bird called the uh, bare-necked umbrella bird, which itself is endangered. Um, that, that's one. There's, there's these um, crested guans, which are kind of like a, a an American turkey. Um, so that they're, and they're, you know, they're probably delicious. Uh, so when we can give them lots of forest and they can hide away, then that's good for them. Um, there's, I mean, there's, I think it's the I'm not, I don't, not the best twitcher, but there's a, a tawny chested flycatcher, which is um, a vulnerable, you know, species of vulnerable to extinction. And then, of course, I mean, that's just the, the birds and the, and the mammals, but, you know, you've got all these frogs and amphibians and you've got orchids. I know, I mean, there's, there's rare orchids, there's, there's rare trees. We're actually in the process of, you know, the trees kind of get forgotten about. We think about the, you know, the macaws are endangered, but there's that the mountain almond tree itself is probably critically endangered when we actually look at getting it on the red list. So we are in the process of trying to get um, several tree species red listed because that will help us protect them as well. Um, so, I mean, there is, uh, there's just a tremendous diversity. Co Costa Rica is just a phenomenal country because it's got, it, it's a small country, but it's got ha lots of altitudinal changes and then sort of different areas because of different winds, dry and, and wet. And, and I mean, there's there's over 900 species of birds in the country. And that's like, this is this tiny little dot of a country. And Australia has only got, you know, about 900 species of birds. So it's, it's you know, the diversity here is phenomenal. When we, when we protect that rainforest, there's all these, all these species. Um, so that, yeah, I don't, I don't, I can't just list off. Uh, my, you know, I can tell you my favorites are some some nice nice birds in there as well. But um, yeah, th there's a whole range of species. It's incredible. I'm sure those audio devices you have are capturing an incredible symphony of of sound. Yeah. Yeah. I encourage if Tom ever wants to share those sound recordings for people to fall asleep to somewhere or something. We're we're working at more like the other end of the the sleep. We're, we're working on it with um uh. A, a company that's going to be um, uh, sponsoring us, and uh, it's a, a, a bottled water company with aluminium bottles, and it's called Rainforest Water. And um, they are we're going to be doing um, an alarm. Um, what the the owner of that company is very into this kind of stuff. We're going to do a uh, an NFT, I think it is. We're going to do you know some of this this modern blockchain stuff. I don't know, and um, and um, we're going to do some audio clips, and so and they're going to incorporate it as an alarm that you can download, so you can wake up to the sound of of macaws. Um, so yeah, it's not quite the melody you might fall asleep to, but more like the you know the sort of bomb going off kind of alarm. Um, that's more a macaws call. Megan called it. She wrote in the chat. She said it'd be a great alarm. So yeah. wonderful. It's exciting to hear. Okay. Uh, some more questions about uh, the technology you guys use. So Tim Mather asked, how long do the, the batteries for the collars that you guys use actually last for? Is that a challenge? Uh, 12 to 18 months. Okay. And do they typically stay on for that long? Or do you find that the macaws find a way to get rid of them by then? Yeah, they generally get rid of them. It's it's definitely it's a big big challenge, and with other species you can use backpacks, and and we 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 have colleagues that have worked with backpacks, but there's about a fifty percent destruction rate before you've got anything. I mean, they just get rid of them in a couple of days. If it's not them, it's their friend that just you know or the parents and stuff. So um, yeah, there's definitely challenges. Mm. Yeah. 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 All right. Well. Uh, one other question we have from Alan, who said he came in late, so forgive him if he discusses a bit at the beginning, I think. Uh, but can you talk more about the captive breeding programs for MRS? Yeah. Yeah. For yeah, well, I mean, I've, I've really done uh, 
this seemed like an opportunity to do a deep dive on the birds. And so I've talked more, more about the birds and, and, and in particular, I've talked about the wild population. But um, <clears throat> one of the, the, the things we work in three main areas, birds, habitat and people. With the birds, we want to increase their numbers as quickly as we can. So we work with the wild population and, and just look at the survival and the productivity and try and increase those where you work out what's the, the, the worst bottleneck and address that bottleneck so that the population increases as quick as we can. But when I came to Costa Rica, there was already um, a center with a collection of birds. There was no breeding going on or anything. And so we've, we've worked uh, to improve that, uh, the breeding center. And um, we now have... Um, each year we have about 12 pairs of great green macaws that are set up to breed and um, they they produce babies and it's their babies that uh, we are going to be releasing back into the wild in an area where there are no great green macaws but there are there is good forest um, and then we support those birds once they're in the wild and that gives them a safety net while they build up this map of where to find wild food and it may even be that the birds we release don't ever become truly independent, but we hope that their offspring will do. And this is that I talked about culture, touched on it a little bit. With wild parrots, they're following their parents around for the first nine months at least. And then they're in social groups learning from each other. And they build up this mental map. And this, this is cultural knowledge that's passed on from one generation to the next. And as the population has receded, um, we've lost some of that cultural knowledge. Um, and it's so that's a bit of a, a, a shame. I think we're barely scratching the surface of, our, of what we know with that. When we do reintroduction, there is no cultural knowledge and we've got to build that up again. So that's definitely a challenge. Um, and that's why we do the supplemental feeding. So. I don't know if that's that. I mean, I, I sort of went beyond the captive breeding there, but I hope that kind of answers the question. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, okay, we are reaching almost the end of the hour. So uh, we have one or two more questions we'll try to get in. Uh, one is from Donna who asked if you see a possibility for volunteers at all to help analyze some of the data from the audio recordings, or I believe most of that is done through some AI machine that Thomas made nowadays too. Yeah, it's huge amounts of data. And um, uh, it's more that... Um, uh, it's it's the, the the researcher themselves needs to go through it, and I don't know the specifics of it because I've just gone okay, you do it. That's how I like to you know, off you go. <laughs> um, uh, I I don't know if it's something that he could uh, delegate in future, so I, I don't know. Okay, thank you. But yeah, there are volunteer opportunities if you guys are interested with the Macaw Recovery Network um, beyond just analyzing data, but also getting the chance to visit. Costa Rica and helping out with the breeding programs or the field research programs. Uh, so definitely check out their website for that if you guys are interested in, in taking a trip down to Costa Rica too. Yeah. Um, all right, well, Sam, we're reaching the end of the hour, but I do wanna ask you one last question. So this week is uh, the United Nations General Assembly is all visiting here in New York where I live uh, yeah. and called Climate Week in New York City. Yeah. Um, so And so a lot of the discussion is about how to uh, protect forests around the world as a as a natural climate solution to help mitigate climate change. So I was curious if you could chat a little bit about MRN's work and obviously you guys market yourselves as a macaw conservation organization, but uh, what do you feel that protecting rainforest for macaws really does to benefit all of humanity beyond just the macaws too? Yeah. Yeah, it's something I'm uh, ever more aware of and, and uh, thinking about. I mean, there's no point saving a few parrots um, if if everything else is is going uh, down the pan, so um, I really do uh, see our organisation going more in the direction of of the forest. Um, it's just it's a key piece of the puzzle, and and it um, if if we have massive impact from global climate uh, change, you know the the crisis we're in. Um, that the the parrots won't survive and so it's just part of that picture it's a deeper motivation and it does benefit um benefits us as well i mean there's um you know that all, all that climate climate uncertainty is going to drive human migration that's going to there's going to be all sorts of fallout so yes protecting forest there's 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 no reason not to protect forest as far as i can you know there's just 
if there's if there's primary forest i mean you go there and it's just magical i mean there's these ancient trees i mean it's just it's amazing and um you just think you know i've talked i've talked in one of my other talks about if they're you know they're 650 years old the 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 the, the mountain almond tree can live for 650 years and it, it's just it blows my mind that somebody could cut that down I and mean, it's just phenomenal so you've got these these this incredible diverse uh forest that's just so complex there's so many things going on there and um we've got to protect that and and the, the, just morally but also selfishly it's in our interest to protect that and for the for the climate and that's one piece of our our work and the other area is restoration so where we we've already made a big stupid error and cut down the forest let's try and put it back it's you know it's going to make things better it absorbs carbon in the process and so on so yeah that's that's a really big deal and we are hoping to get started on on forest protection uh sort of very very soon hopefully by expo we you know we should actually have some uh some feedback on some funding and and that will kickstart our effort to to be securing this forest um it's yeah it's huge huge uh part of part of um the, the picture that we need and then you know I talk about the three things, birds, habitat, people. There's there's no point saving the forest if we're not also working with the people and, and um, basically encouraging them to love nature and, and nature protection and conservation as much as we do. So we've got to, we've got to invest deeply in the communities as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I think you guys have a great strategy to do it. And I think investing in, in small community-based organizations like MRN is really where a lot of the bang for your buck goes for climate change mitigation as well. And, protecting for us so thank you guys for the incredible work you're doing uh we do have to wrap it up pretty much though uh but if we did not get to any of your questions please reach out to us at wcn or to mrn as well uh megan has dropped a bunch of our email contacts in the chat um but i just want to say thank you so much to sam for joining us today and for the audience uh for tuning in i think it was a really interesting conversation at least for me it was i learned a lot so thank you so much um if you guys are interested, we will have further closer looks like this, again, continuing uh, in November, November 18th, with the Elephant Crisis Fund. Um, but even before that, uh, we do have our WCN annual expo coming up in about a week and a half or so, uh, starting October 1st, which you guys can register if you're interested at over at WCNExpo.org. Uh, so we encourage you to check that out. But thank you again, Sam. We appreciate you taking the time today to chat to a lot of the followers around the world. Um, and I hope you all have a great weekend. Thanks, though. Thank you. Cheers.